So round 14 now complete. We've been to Mazzano twice. Mazzano 2 will be summing up here today. And some really hot talking points in this one. So um, grab a cup of tea, you know. We're in for quite a discussion here. A big talking point. Uh, well, two, two big... I mean, which is the bigger talking point? Peko going down or the pass? The overtake on the last lap there. Let's start with the overtake. Is this splitting opinions? Uh, maybe. It's it's one of those ones that's so, such a grey area. It, it In the end, it didn't get even investigated by the stewards as far as I'm aware. It is an interesting one. Obviously, let me know how you saw it. it is this one of those ones where everyone's... Like people are sort of split 50-50 on whether it should be a pen like a penalty or not or is this one of those ones where it's um everybody kind of has the same opinion which is it was probably a bit over the line but you wouldn't punish it anyway which is kind of where I'm at with it like it's hard it's a hard one to gauge because it's one of those ones where like if you if you take the laws of Grand Prix racing and I don't know if this is in the laws of MotoGP racing but but generally it's kind of an accepted guideline that if you make a hard overtake or if there's contact, but you don't make the corner, if you end up off the track, then that's an illegal pass. You know, you're not staying within the boundaries of the circuit to make the overtake. In that sense, an A has not made the corner. So technically, you'd have to say this is one where this should have been penalised. But there's something with this pass particularly where does it pass the eye test? Like if, if, you, if you get what I'm saying, you know, on paper, this... This has this is a punishable offence, right? On paper. Contact didn't make the corner. I don't know the contact was... But when I say does it pass the eye test, I mean, but when you watch the incident, you're like, yeah, it's not that bad. You're like, I'm fine with that. Like, is everybody in that same boat where you're like, well, technically, he's run off the road there. But then when you watch it and you're like, low speed corner, not much contact, what was he like 20 centimeters off the road like it was a tire width off the road so he, he almost made the corner which i guess either it's it's got to be surely it's black and white though like you make the corner you don't but he only just went off the edge of the the ripple strip there it was brilliant to watch so and and, and made for good drama and good entertainment which i guess has nothing to do with it if you're judging it as a sporting incident but it made for good entertainment and when you look at it you're like wasn't that bad he just ran him off the road. Like, who cares? Seen that happen hundreds of times, you know, in the past when you've been watching Grand Prix racing a long time. It's just something that motorcycle racing, that's what that's what they do. That is what they do. Yeah, for me, it's one. I wouldn't punish it, but technically, a bit naughty. But let me know what you think of it. I'd, I'm happy to see that let go. Let the boys play. And let them play. Let the boys play. Yeah, I'd be really interested to know what the general consensus is on that one. I probably should have done a poll. Maybe I will do one. Now, in terms of the race itself... It was a hot start. It was a hot start. The three big boys got away nice and early. The three guys you expected to be contending. Peko, Jorge, and the Beast all scrapping early on. Brilliant to watch. Brilliant first few laps. Uh, and then something interesting happened. And Peko dropped right off the back of the two of them. Of the one guy that I didn't expect to drop away, it was probably him. He was so good on Saturday in the sprint. Perfect sprint race for him. So to see him dropping away in that way was... Quite a surprise. Not sure exactly what happened. The tyre just didn't light up for him at that phase of the Grand Prix. It, it lost performance in some way, I think is the suggestion. Not lost performance, but it didn't build. It didn't bite for him like it was for everyone else when you get into that second phase of the race after the first few laps. He's dropped on about like three seconds or so back from the lead. Now, at this point, I was like, well, he's going to fall behind Mark here surely but he, he he managed to find something there steadied the ship got the tire working and started to make ground back and started to do the sort of lap times we expected to see from him even better than actually like he was absolutely flying and he was eating up the ground and it was only a matter of time we're like we're getting it we're getting finally a grandstand finish between Pecco and Martin and Chuck Bastianini in there for, for good measure, uh, who we know is so great late in races. So this was shaping up to be like the race of the season, like you know, absolute grandstand uh, finish. And we got a grandstand finish in the end, but Madge had all three of them in there would have been bl bloody brilliant. So unfortunately, Pecco has thrown it down the road. This is just another one of those ones with these lads between the two of them. I mean, Martin's been a lot better this season for me in terms of his consistency he was always a bit inconsistent and now he has made mistakes 
whether you consider his mistake, Mazzano won as a consistency thing. I mean, he's made an error in judgment there. It wasn't a technical error in terms of riding the bike and chucking the thing down the road. So his consistency, you can't quite question it as much. But with Peko, this just this... This guy could be a three-time world champion at the end of this season. And you'd still be sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, but he doesn't stay on it that often, does he? Like, <laughs> every time he gets in a good position, he makes his job harder. And then it almost makes it more impressive when he comes back and wins the championship later in the season, doesn't it? Because you're like, well, he had to come back against the odds here. He is unbelievable talent, Peko Banyar. I think when he's on, he's so, so good. He's as good as anyone. You know, he's got that Lorenzo about him where he can just be like, bang, 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 bang. But... Where in the past we'd see with title contenders, you look back through old results of guys who've won championships, you know, and you're talking, if we go back, well, the era I grew up watching in, you know, the early 2000s with Rossi, uh, and then as you moved on then to Stoner, Lorenzo, even Pedrosa, even though he never won a world championship, but you go back and look at their results throughout a season, there's no DNFs there. There's rarely, rarely ever a DNF. You know, is it, is it one of those ones that, the bikes are so much more on edge now, or is the talent not as high? Why are we getting so many DNFs from these guys? And Peko is a huge culprit for this. Like I said, back in the day, if it was two guys going for the world championship, so it was, you know, when you look back at the Rossi Gibbonows and things like that, even when it was, you know, if you if you say Gibbonow is your Martin in your in your satellite team and things like that, these guys were going at each other late in races almost every week. They were always on track together, always fighting each other. Now we never see it. One wins, then the other wins. The other one's nowhere near it. When I say nowhere near it, they might be in second, but they're a way off. Maybe it is something to do with, I mean, we can go into things like are the bikes able to follow each other as closely and things like that. But at the end of the day, you had that this week. This race, Bastianini spends five, six laps right on the back wheel of Martin there. So it can be done. You know, maybe it is a little harder than it used to be, but it can be done. And while I'm not expecting it every week like it used to be, it doesn't happen at all. Like, I can't remember. When was the last time Martin and Banyaya fought on the last lap for a Grand Prix win? It just doesn't happen. Because one of them falls way back or crashes. And that's it. We, ne- we never see them together. They were together early in races, maybe when they get off the line and they've got to scrap for the first couple of laps, but then one either gets away or the other one, when we're teased into a situation like we were this week, it, it, it goes away on them. It's, it's a really interesting, really interesting um, study, I think, into like, what, why is that? For me, it's got to be the riders are just like, because you can follow. You can at least be within a few bike lengths of someone come the end of the race. Maybe you can't challenge it. Maybe it's so hard, hard to pass these days. You can't make that challenge. Like Bastianini had to make it a bit tough this way. He had to do a hard move. So maybe you can't make the challenge so we won't get the scrap. But why are they never even close to one another? Maybe I'm just not remembering races where it has happened, but I feel like they're always like there's always a f- couple of seconds instead of a couple of tenths come the end of the race. So it's just interesting. I just think it's an interesting point. If you genuinely think it is because the bikes can't follow as much anymore, then that's fine. Um, but you know, but my point is, a lot of the time is because one of them crashes. One of them crashes. So we're not seeing these guys that are going for world championship at the moment. They're not. Are they really, really, really that? Are they alien level? That I always guess is what I'm trying to say. Or are they just like, these guys are just like Melandri, Dovi, Gibbonow, Crutchlow. You know, are they these guys, but in a time where there's not an elite guy? Or if there is elite guys, they're in different situations. So Mark on a GP23, coming back from his injury, still getting used to a bike, whatever. Next year, is he going to just absolutely belt everyone? Fabio Quattararo is on a struggling Yamaha, although we will talk about him later because he had an excellent couple of rounds here. You know, are the are the only elite guys left not on the updated machinery so or the best machinery, so we're not seeing them at the front as much? And then these guys are just like, is, is Peko just Dovi in a better situation? Is Martin like Carlos Checker? Like, what are we? What, where are we at here? Or are these guys elite guys, but the bikes are so much harder to keep on the limit all the time that they do crash more often? Let me know. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think. I think it's a really interesting discussion to have. But yeah, that's how it plays out. It leaves Peko now 24 points off the lead. Interestingly, does anyone think there's a hope for the Bastianini Marquez chase? 59 and 60 points off the lead, respectively. Can either of them do it? And I will say about Bastianini, a couple of times this season, this kid is... Say, kid, he's in mid twenties now, isn't he? He box office, isn't he? When he gets in these situations on the last, day, he's not scared to have a crack. The move at Magello springs to mind when he got Martin there on the last corner, and this move now, 
is box office. Okay. Now, we said we're going to talk about Fabio. We're going to talk about Fabio right now. And we're going to go into the All Japan Cup. Fabio, two seventh place finishes in a row. In the aftermath of the race, he was asked if that's good progress and stuff like that. That will caveat that with he was coming fifth. He was coming fifth. He ran out of fuel on the last couple of corners and had to roll it over the line. So it would have been a fifth place finish for Fabio. Unreal. Unreal. Now, I like I said earlier, mentioned earlier, I think he's one of the elite, elite talents. So the acid test for Yamaha is where would Rins have been? Didn't get to start this week and he was ill. Rins is probably a bit more where you're at, right? Now, like I said, while I think Fabio is an elite, elite talent, I think Rins is bloody excellent, by the way, as well. I think he's absolutely class. Uh, but he's just probably not that, that level, right? So where Rins is, I think he's going to be extracting quite a lot out of it, uh, more than what, for example, you'd get out of like Oliver and Miller next year. Uh, so he'll be above that level. But it's more of a where you can be with just a really top rider, like a good rider, without him having to be above and beyond the bike. So where Rins will be will be a very good test of where they're at. But Fabio has come out and said after the race that he still doesn't think it's that encouraging. High standards for these guys, isn't it? Uh, because he's still behind a couple of GP23s. Does he finish behind... Bez and Mark there. Now, Mark scratched that off because he's going to be running around at the front. So you're not going to be ahead of him anyway. So Bez, you could be like, well, you know, Bez has finished nine seconds off the lead. Could you be in front of him? I think you'd be a stretch, to be honest. Bez has a good Grand Prix. He's had a track he knows like the back of his hand. You know, it's maybe you're not going to beat Bez on a day like that either. You know, so I think it is encouraging for them. But, you know, like I said, these guys, they're elite level. He has high standards. He wants more more from his employer. He would have finished fifth, which would have put him under 13 and a half seconds off the lead. I'm not sure how far he was ahead of Morbidelli at the time, but Morbidelli in fifth finished 13.6 seconds off the lead. So he'd probably been 12 seconds off the lead, I say. 12 and a half, maybe. The week before, he was 17 seconds off the lead, uh, which was a, make that what you will, it was a bit of a crazy race. So I think that's not bad. I don't know how far off the lead they were early in the season when they were finishing races, you know, the first five rounds. They must be closer now. They must be. Positionally, it's a lot closer. I guess that's all you can take from it. But again, sensational from Fab, so I think it was great. Really like, like got to get him. Yamaha, I think Yamaha, and I've been saying this for, while both, as soon as both Japanese manufacturers started struggling a lot, I always thought Yamaha were in a better position. Even with just the two bikes, they just seem to be figuring it out a little bit better. Was that being, I mean, and it really was, it's like, is Fabio just overriding it? But then you could say the same about Mark back in the day, couldn't you? So I have always thought that the Yamaha does look a bit more rideable just for the normal MotoGP rider. And it is proving now to be the case that they are ahead of Honda, definitely. Now, in the All Japan Cup, another win for Fabio. That's another two wins in Mazzano for him, two seventh places, as I mentioned. He goes to 102 points. So, but Mir picks up a second place this week. So Mir, this week was Fabio, Mir, Marini, then Zarco, Taka, and Rin. So Zarco and Taka, normally the two best Hondas, I've got to say. Normally the two best Hondas. Been beaten by the Repsol boys here. So well done to them. Luca Marini, third place in the All Japan Cup this week. No Rins to contend with, of course. So the standings after Mazzano 2, 14th round of the championship. Fabio Quattararo cracks the ton, 100 points. 102 points for Fabio Quattararo now. Taka Nakagami stays second. Taka on 57 points. Zarko closes a touch to 55 points. Rin stays on 43 with his non-start. Mir goes to 39. Marini goes to 33. Bradle, who raced Mazzano 1, Picked up a few points there, fourth that day, with the uh, the non-starts from... I think both Repsols didn't start as well that day, did they? So, Brattle got three points there, so he's on seven and Remy stays on three. Now, it's looking like we're going to see... Did I hear right? Dovey's going to be chipping in for Yamaha somewhere, so we might get him in there as well at some point. That'd be great to see. Hopefully, he gets a point when he does race. Uh, so, we get another man on the leaderboard there. So, that's how it stands for the All Japan Cup. Now on to Moto2. This was a cool because we had three great uh, great races this week. So this was great. Vietti, somehow, with where he was positioned going into the last lap. Was it the last lap or the second last lap that he, he made the error through on the switch back from one to two? He had a bit of a... Well, kind of just tried to buck him off, didn't it? Uh, and ended up third. And it was like, well, he's done for the day. It's a duel at the front. Can it and Arbolino. And then Arbolino... 
Oh, my goodness. Going into uh, that last sequence of corners there, you could just see him frantically trying to pull this thing up. He knew he'd got it wrong straight away. Straight away. You could see him just like punching down through the gears, trying to get it pulled up without crashing, basically, because to get it pulled up at that point, he would have had to have a big, big old squeeze of the brake. And so he did the best he could in the end, but it's just a misjudgment. He's just got it wrong. He's ended up getting that wrong. And then Canet, inheriting the lead, Defend over defended the last corner, as I guess you wouldn't know, would you? And Vietti's just managed to punch it to the line. What a finish! Great Grand Prix, great Grand Prix. It was great seeing the three of them fighting. Good two uh, Italians at the front uh, in Mazzano, always good to see. But I will say with Arbolino, definitely Arbolino, especially, is consistently more at the front now. So I mean, two of those races were at Mazzano, so maybe that has something to do with it. But encouraging for him has he figured it out hopefully Vietti's starting to get a bit more consistently at the front too as well building him in like his, his season's done here but if he can just keep these results going and build into a good strong next season that'd be uh quality for him and there was drama earlier in the race with Sergio Garcia going down and this kid is speaking of Vietti he's doing a Vietti that year the Vietti was just like rolling on you're like world champion here definitely he's getting the VR46 seat done and dusted and then he started to do what Garcia is doing now and Agura good enough to be like struggling a bit uh, in that race but a bit like Peko uh, struggling a bit to keep up with the front guys uh, and it looked like he was falling back into the clutches of the guys behind him Aldeguer especially uh, but steadied steadied the ship got his head down thought bring it home here did the, did the job and you never know with that kind of fighting at the front I mean we did anything can happen you can inherit a win from those sort of situations sometimes. So did all the right things and goes 22 points clear in the championship now because of that. And Garcia, I can see him finishing behind the likes of Roberts and Alonso Lopez. Aldeguer, can he get there? You know, the thing is, he's not crashing from good positions either. Like where he's, cra- he's crashing from mid-pack. He doesn't actually even have the pace at the moment to get himself near the front. So look, I like the kid. I think he's brilliant. But this season's slipping away from him quickly. He needs to get to a circuit that he likes. He needs a bit of confidence. He needs to get somewhere where he can roll the bike out of the back of the truck on Friday and just be like, I'm running in the top three, practice one, practice two, you know, and qualify himself on the front two rows. He he desperately needs a circuit to come along where it just clicks for him. Desperately. Uh, but going into the Asian legs now, it's, you're in Ayagura's backyard now. I, I'm, I don't know his history. I, to be honest, I can't remember his history is like in these Grand Prix Ayagura, but I assume he's raced a lot of these circuits. Well, maybe not. Maybe he would have just raced around Japan and stuff a lot when he was younger, but I could just be stereotyping badly here. But um, I assume he's going to be strong uh, in this section of the uh, championship. I've got Igor as absolute favourite from here. Absolutely. Not just because he's winning the World Championship. He could be 20 points down. I'd probably have him as favourite if this was the form coming into it. So Moto3, David Alonso does it again. Something about this kid on last laps. I've, I've gone on about him doing this so many times. I've just gone on and on and on about it, right? He has this way on a last lap. If he gets to the front, you can't pass him. I always say it's like a precision thing and an accuracy and well, it's just generally being quite good, isn't it? Like he just hits every single brake marker perfectly. He's on the right line. He gives you no chance to pass him. If you did want to pass him, you pretty much have to hit him. I mean, I've, go back and watch my old videos. I've gone on and on about it. So good. Uh, really good race again, this one. Pekeris, really impressive. He's been really, really impressive. Did almost everything he needed to do to, to win the race here. A few of them did. Olgado was great as well. Uh, and Vaya sort of picking up, sort of ran around at the back of the group. Uh, had to catch him up a little bit at one point, if my memory is correct. Ended up picking up third place. So, I mean, not much else to say. David Alonso is the best in the field. How many has he won this season? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Six rounds to go. He's got eight wins. He'll win at least half of those. He'll win half of them. Yeah, Olgado still hanging on in, well, equal second in the championship now. Vaya's leveled him. I really like Conor Vaya. Even Ortola's dropped away a little bit that that one. He um, didn't have the best race. But yeah, three really good Grand Prix. We're trying to get these quick turnarounds done now because we're off to um, Indonesia now. And there's like seven Grand, six Grand Prix in seven weeks here to close it out. Hang on for dear life. They're coming thick and fast. We'll see you on the next one. Oh, and I obviously missed... My wrap after the last one, I was away in Scotland. When I got back, just couldn't be asked to be fair. And I'm like four races behind, probably about to be five races behind on um, my power rankings. I have done them. I have been up to date with them. I haven't been able to make the graphics time consuming and I 
like I said, I was, I was away for a week and a week and a bit in Scotland, driving around, drinking whiskey and not at the same time. I wasn't drink driving or stopping then drinking the whiskey, playing golf and shit. So I've been a busy guy, so I haven't got them done, but they I will catch up with them at some point. You'll be able to see where everyone was at after each Grand Prix. See you after Indonesia. Should be a cracker. Hopefully it doesn't rain too much and uh, we'll see you on the next one.